Okay, so good uh, evening, everyone, or good morning to our speaker. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the second plenary speaker for today, who is uh, Andrew Stewart. Andrew is the Brand Professor of Computing and Mathematical Sciences at Caltech, where he's been at 20, since 2016. Previously, he's held positions at the University of Warwick in the Department of Mathematics, where he was for 17 years. Prior to that, he, he's been at Stanford University, at Bath University, held postdoc positions at MIT and Oxford, where he also got his PhD in 1986. Uh, Andrew's had a, a long and distinguished career. Uh, he's known mainly for his work uh, studying algorithms which use data to inform predictive mathematical models with applications in the physical, biomedical, and social sciences. His research forges links between applied math and statistics and draws on emerging methodologies in machine learning. His research achievements include the development of a mathematical framework for the Bayesian formulation of inverse problems and the analysis and design of Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and ensemble Kalman filter methods for the solution of these inverse problems, which is also going to be the topic of his lecture today. Andrew's won uh, quite a collection of prizes uh, through the years. He's won three prizes uh, awarded by Cyan, the, the Dahlquist Prize, uh, the Crawford Prize, and oh, another prize, which I... Uh, Wilkinson. Wilkinson, thank you, Andrew. Uh, he's also won the Whitehead Prize from the London Math Society and the Leslie Fox Prize uh, awarded by the IMA. He was an ICIAM invited speaker uh, in Zurich 2007. He was an ICM invited speaker in 2014. Uh, most recently, uh, this year, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society. So we congratulate him on that. Andrew's written a number of uh, influential books. Uh, so he wrote uh, a book on numerical analysis and dynamical systems way back uh, with, together with Humphreys a book on multi-scale methods, averaging and homogenization with Pavliotis, a textbook on continuum mechanics with Gonzalez, and a more recent book, a book on data assimilation uh, with Law and Sigalakis. And so now, without further ado, uh, Andrew Stewart, Blending Data and Models, Kalman-Based Approaches. Thank you, Oliver. That was a really nice introduction, and I really appreciate the opportunity of lecturing to you all especially appreciate it given that it's your 6 p.m. So thank you for staying on and, and listening. Um, the, the topic of the talk is, as you see, blending data with mathematical models. Um, I consider this to be one of the great challenges for applied mathematics in the coming century. And I want to tell you something about Kalman based approaches to this um, question, um, which I believe are central to the future of blending data and models. Um, I've tried to configure the talk so it's widely accessible and appropriate for 6 p.m. Um, I hope you'll find that it is. Um, the slides I'm happy to make available and in that you will be able to follow up with more mathematical details if you're interested. So I'm going to uh, start briefly by giving a historical context for the way in which data is used in mathematical modeling taking celestial mechanics and where it led to as an example and then i'm going to describe what the common methodology is and describe it from the perspective of optimization and in particular an optimization criterion which allows for the incorporation of data and mathematical model simultaneously I'll look at uh, an example in weather forecasting to illustrate ideas. And then I will show you how the whole methodology can be applied to the solution of inverse problems. In some sense, inverse problems are the generic formulation of the question, the mathematical formulation of the question of how one combines data with a model. So I'll show you how the Kalman methods have led to the solution of inverse problems. And uh, then at the end of the talk, I'll describe some mathematical structure that is uh, underpins ensemble Kalman inversion, um, in particular a gradient flow, various gradient flow structures. So if there are things which require 
clarification, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, if Oliver thinks they're appropriate to pick up on the fly, then he will interrupt me. And otherwise, I'm happy to take questions at the end. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the use of data in celestial mechanics. And really, the purpose of this is to indicate to you how things have changed, um, but also to uh, tell you what I believe in, which is the scientific method. Um, so uh, celestial mechanics provides a good way of looking at this question. So um, Brahe's work was purely based on observational data. And um, this was initially by I, in fact, and can be viewed as what would now be called big data in the uh, current era of machine learning. And this is in the 1600s. And uh, Kepler took this data and derived mathematical formulae, which interpolated the data that Brahe had collected. And one can think of this as a, a data-driven model. The data was available. Uh, here were some equations which were compatible with that data, and it led to Kepler's law. But there was no first principles in the problem at this point. Newton's work uh, rationalized this by having a first principles approach to what's now known as Newtonian mechanics, um, which explains Kepler's law as a consequence of those um, underlying principles and indeed then taking those underlying principles this led to much more complex modeling and the theory of conservation laws and an important point here is that um, extrapolation beyond the region in which the data is given to us was a major part of the success of mathematical modeling and I, I would like to contrast this with machine learning which currently uh, does little in the way of extrapolation so I'm making a case here for the important, a case which you all understand as mathematicians, the importance of mathematical models and not just the use of data. Data here played a big role, but it led to something, the theory of conservation laws, which extrapolates when, well beyond where the data was given. And of course, um, Newton's laws were not perfect. And um, for example, the Mercury's perihelion uh, precession was not predicted by Newton's work and uh, Einstein's work initially on special relativity moved towards a better prediction and, and nailed it with general relativity. And this is the scientific method. We return back to uh, further pieces of data and use them to test mathematical models and um, improve them. So in this little story, you see that data plays a role. It played a role at the beginning. Um, it played a role at the end of this little story in correcting the models. And indeed, along the way, data is used, for example, if you want to uh, make a prediction about a ballistic projectile, then you need to know the gravitational constant, so that has to be measured. But uh, data, in some sense, is very separate from the models. It's used to inform the models, used to check the models, used to give constants within the models. But in some sense, the way we think about um, the model and the data uh, is as two separate interacting uh, entities. And the point I would like to make about Kalman's work, which we'll move on to next, is that arguably it is the first work in which data and model were put together on the same footing and an overarching mathematical model was proposed in which the predictive power of scientific understanding was combined directly with a model for the acquisition of data to give a meta mathematical model which enables one to make predictions which both use scientific understanding in the form of mathematical modeling and data. So I'm going to describe uh, Kalman's work um, mathematically in a second, that's in the upper box here. I just wanted to say something about his work and the particular paper which underpins everything in this talk. It was published in 1960 in the Journal of Basic Engineering and currently has attracted around 35,000 citations in, in Google Scholar. I guess the initial application was navigation and it was used in the Apollo 11 manned landing. And let me describe to you the, the basic setup. Uh, Kalman was concerned with dynamical models and in, interested in a state Vn, which evolves according to a linear dynamical system with the addition of noise. And he made the assumption 
that data was available, Yn, in the form of a linear transformation H applied to the output of the dynamical model Vn, again with the addition of noise. And the assumption is that the initial condition is known only as a random variable. And for the precise theory I'm going to describe, the noises disturbing the dynamical model and the data are also assumed to be Gaussian. Now the details of the, the uh, structure that underlies this, you don't need to, to appreciate in detail. Um, what I would like to highlight is that with these assumptions, um, it is a relatively straightforward fact to show that the signal Vn, now looking at the second from last bullet, the signal Vn, given all of the data up to time n, that's uppercase Yn, collection of all of the data up to n, um, is a Gaussian random variable. And therefore, to make predictions about the system, one has to know the mean and the covariance of this random variable. And what the Kalman filter does, which is the main output of this well-cited paper, it provides an algorithm to update the mean and the covariance of the state of the system given the data. Okay, so the two key points here are, Kalman wrote down a formalism which combined the model and the data in a single meta model. And he then came up with an algorithm for updating predictions about the state Vn given the data Yn. In his setting, the algorithm is involved because of the Gaussian structure, involves updating the mean and the covariance. And there's a Markovian structure to that, meaning that one can, knowing the mean and covariance at time n, can compute the same objects at time n plus one. Okay, now I'm not going to go into the details of the formulae, but what I want to highlight, because it's instructive for the rest of the talk, is a way of thinking about what Kalman did in terms of optimization. And even if you don't take in the details of the formulae, there are some, or there is a single concept behind this, which is uh, universally applicable, widely applicable to problems in which one has a mathematical model, which one wishes to combine with data. So in words, the, the basic idea that underlies Kalman is that one should first predict with the model and then solve an optimization problem in which one minimizes an objective function which constrains the solution so that it's close to the prediction of the model and close to the data. So that's a very persuasive idea that can be used throughout the um, sciences and engineering in the context of dynamical models where data is present. Predict with the model and then solve an optimization problem of some kind which states the concept that you wish to be close to the prediction because you believe in the model and you wish to be close to the data because you've acquired the data and you believe it to be informative. The details of what that objective function are will depend on the specifics of what you assume about the accuracy of the model and the data acquisition process. In the case of the Kalman filter, um, that ob objective function is quadratic. One, uh, it's an objective function over M and one has a quadratic norm measuring closeness to the prediction and a quadratic norm measuring closeness of HM. H is the observation operator to the data. And a natural question is to ask how to balance the size of these two terms. And that's done using um, a piece of notation which will be useful if you internalize for the rest of this talk. So if I can come down to this bullet here, uh, the, a single bar is the Euclidean norm. I will work in finite dimensions for the purpose of this talk, although one can generalize beyond that. A single bar is the Euclidean norm and the Euclidean norm weighted by A is computed by applying a to the minus a half to the object that you wish to compute the norm of and then evaluating the Euclidean norm for any positive definite symmetric matrix A. <clears throat> and A will always be a covariance matrix when one does this. So in um, the Kalman filter, the prediction is weighted by a covariance which is computed through a separate update, which I'm not going to describe. <clears throat> and the um, closeness to the data is weighted by a covariance given by the assumptions on the noise 
which enters the mathematical model. Then one minimizes this quadratic optimization problem, which can be done by pencil and paper, and that you call the minimizer mn plus one. And this gives a mapping that takes you from the state at time n to the state at time n plus one, and sequentially incorporates the data and uses the model through the prediction. Okay, so that's, a, I think, a very generally useful way of thinking about making predictions and using data. The method has been generalized way beyond the setting of Kalman and an, an important direction in which the impact of the work has been so successful has led to the use of the methodology more widely is weather forecasting. So in weather forecasting, the dynamical model is now nonlinear. M is replaced by psi, um, but the data acquisition model is still linear in, most sim in the simplest setting. Um, so this idea was introduced by Andrew Lorenz. Um, despite the C at the end, it's pronounced like Lorenz, as in the uh, Lorenz equation person. And uh, Andrew worked at the UK Met Office, where he was until recently head of data assimilation. Um, the 3D VAR method is based on the optimization principle, which is at the heart of the common filter, but um, does not update covariances, simply updates the state. So it gives a mapping, which is nonlinear, from the state at time n to the state at time n plus one, using the model and the data. And it does so in much the same way that uh, Kalman's method works. Um, a prediction is made using the model. So the model here is a discretization of the Navier-Stokes equations of fluid mechanics on a sphere. And that prediction is then entered into an optimization objective function in which one seeks to find a V which is both close to the prediction and close to the observed data. Uh, minimizing this gives Vn plus one, and Vn plus one then is a function of the state at time n and the data at time n plus one, resulting in a prediction at time n plus one. And again, there's a weighting of the prediction of the model by a covariance c hat and the weighting of the data by a covariance gamma, which weight the Euclidean norm and encapsulate how much one believes in the model prediction versus the data prediction. So for example, if gamma is very large, that means there's large uncertainty in the observations and this second term is downweighted. On the other hand, if this covariance is very large, then the predictions of the model are downweighted because they are associated with large uncertainty. The idea, central idea of 3D VAR, unlike the Kalman filter, which updates the covariance that appears in the subjective function, um, what Andrew Lorentz suggested was to use a fixed C-bar based on what's called climatology. That's the average properties of the atmosphere. And this is combined with some simple computable structure that makes the linear algebra handleable because whilst um, Kalman's initial success was in navigation of Apollo 11, which is a relative, relatively low dimensional system, um, current weather forecasting systems have billions of variables. So there are order 10 to the nine variables. So a full covariance matrix has order 10 to the 18 entries, and that's prohibitive in general. So hence simple computable structure is imposed along with average climatology. All right, this was very successful, but as I will show you, can be approved on uh, considerably um, by noting that fixing C-bar is a reasonable thing to do, putting an average uncertainty into this level of uncertainty in the predictions of the model. But the next idea in this uh, sequence is the idea of the ensemble Kalman filter. And in words, the idea of this methodology, which was introduced by a Norwegian, Geir Evansson, in the 1990s, is that the uncertainty in the model, which is used to weight the first term in the objective function, can be estimated if instead of running a single set of predictions, one has an ensemble of predictions. So now V sub n denotes the state at time n, and these ensemble is indexed by J, and typically in applications 
in the geophysical sciences, there are roughly 100 ensemble members that are used. So uppercase J is size 100. So one has a collection of estimates of the state of the atmosphere, and they can be used to compute a covariance, which can be used to weight the objective function that I've just been talking about. So the only difference in the ensemble method versus 3D VAR is that, again, one predicts with the nonlinear model, but now on the basis of those predictions, one estimates the covariance. And roughly speaking, if the predictions vary greatly, that would lead one to have less certainty in the predictions of the model. The covariance will be larger and the predictions will be downweighted in the subjective function relative to the noise. So one solves an objective function for every ensemble member, but the objective functions are coupled together through this covariance. So there's a kind of um, mean field coupling, and indeed we will return to looking at this from a mean field perspective at the end of the talk. Um, key things about this then are the first point, which I've mentioned, namely that having the ensemble enables one to estimate the uncertainty in the model predictions, and thereby weight appropriately the contribution of the model prediction into the objective function, which also includes the data. And then the second high level important fact is that I've mentioned to you that in large geophysical models, such as weather forecasting, there may be billions of state variables. So D may be order 10 to the nine. Um, however, this method has proven successful in a way I will show you with only order 100 ensemble members. So the storage goes from D squared to JD, D being a billion, but J being only of size 100. So those two facts, the fact that one can systematically estimate uncertainty in the model, and in the context of weather forecasting, in fact, learn about instabilities in the atmosphere, that, uh, that combined with the computational efficiency have made this a widely used method. One of the things I'd like you to take from this talk is that although it's a widely used method, it's a little understood method from the point of view of mathematics, and this presents a great opportunity for our community. And I'm going to show you as the talk progresses, uh, some of the initial forays into analysis of these methods, um, but re-emphasizing that there is enormous space for mathematicians to contribute to this field, um, exciting mathematical questions, and impacts on a wide range of applications. So actually, um, regarding mathematical structure, Sebastian Reich at Potsdam has been one of the people who has really set alight the field from a mathematical perspective. He's made significant contributions to studying the Kármán filter, ensemble Kármán filter that I've just described to you through continuous time limit, and also um, has made connections with optimal transport. Um, when I come to discuss mathematical structure later on in this talk, I will be doing it primarily in the context of inverse problems. And the ideas of Sebastian uh, come back up there and have been pivotal in my work. And actually there's a, an SFB at Potsdam in data assimilation, uh, which is led by Sebastian Reich. Okay, so let me give you the example of weather forecasting to show you um, something of what is to be gained from using Ensemble over 3D VAR when predicting the weather. Um, but first, actually, let me just give you some idea about how 3D VAR works. Um, as you have all probably heard of the butterfly effect, that's the concept that chaotic dynamical systems are difficult to predict because small changes in the initial condition can lead to large changes in a short period of time. A lot, so that therefore prediction is difficult, um, even in, in the presence of very accurate initial conditions. Um, it, this computational example is based on the Navier-Stokes equation on a two-dimensional torus. And the point of what I'm showing you here is that the actual signal, which under, this is a simulation study in which one studies the uh, difference between the predictions of the 3D VAR algorithm and the actual signal which is used to generate the data which enters the algorithm. The actual signal in blue and the prediction of the 3D VAR algorithm 
diverge. And what I'm showing you here is the projection onto one of the divergence-free Fourier modes of the Navier-Stokes equations as a function of time. And the fact that they diverge is an indication that the butterfly effect, the chaotic nature of the Navier-Stokes equations at the Reynolds number used here, causes divergence, in this case, not only of trajectories, but also of the 3D VAR algorithm, which takes observations of the trajectory and combines them with the model to make predictions. And if you look at the overall error in the um, L2 norm, this grows with time to order one and then saturates. But there are parameters that enter the 3D VAR algorithm. And if one chooses them correctly, it's possible to make predictions over arbitrarily long time intervals that are accurate, despite the fact that the system being predicted is chaotic. And roughly speaking, if one observes enough of the instabilities in the system and uses that information in an appropriate fashion, one can predict chaotic systems using data for arbitrary long time intervals. And um, there's work that uh, starts with Edris Titi, which is fundamental to this uh, understanding this phenomenon and uh, proving what you see here for the Navier-Stokes equation um, in the presence of noise is something that I have undertaken with Daniel Sansalonzo. What I would like you to take away from this is that the 3D VAR method with appropriate choices of parameters uh, can predict chaotic dynamical systems if one also observes enough of the unstable dynamics. And in this case, um, you see that the error remains up small for arbitrarily long time intervals. But an important point here is that I have had to tune parameters to make this work. Um, the ensemble common filter automatically computes the parameters that are relevant to the system and its ability to track the underlying signal. And the following figure, which is, um, was shared with, but to me by Roland Pothast, who's head of data assimilation at the German Weather Forecasting Service, is a figure which shows the advantages of using the Ensemble Kármán filter over 3D VAR in predicting weather. Now, in, in contrast to the previous slides where we had a simulation study based on the Navier-Stokes equation, um, this is based on uh, an actual weather forecasting data and comparison with the data with the predictions made by Ensemble Common Filter and 3D VAR. So there's a notion of skill, which measures accuracy of predictions made by these methods. And uh, skill is on this axis here, runs between zero and one, but the axis is cut off at 0.5. So this is higher skill, more accurate, lower skill down here. And this is the time horizon over which one forecasts in hours going from 24 through 48 up to 144 hours. So if you fix a given level of skill, say 90% accuracy, and then ask how long can I predict for using 3D VAR, you hit this blue curve here and you have around 60 hours. Um, whereas if you use the Ensemble Kármán filter, you wait to hit the red curve and you find that you have a prediction time of around 80 hours. So for this particular level of skill, 90%, you see the advantage of using the ensemble method over 3D VAR to make predictions. And so th this, the benefits of the ensemble method and the fact that it can be vectorized in, uh, in com on modern parallel computers so that it's efficient have led to its wide adoption in weather forecasting. And what I would again like to emphasize is despite that, the mathematical analysis of it is only just beginning and provides a fantastic opportunity for, for the applied mathematics community. Okay, so I've talked to you so far about dynamical models and um, the particular things we talked about were uh, navigation systems, landing the Apollo 11 on the moon, weather forecasting. Uh, the initial idea for ensemble method came from oceanography. That's where Evanson introduced it, but was also introduced and used within weather forecasting. is now widely used there. What I want to do now is turn attention to um, ensemble common methods for solving inverse problems. 
And these are generic formulations of the question of how to confront a mathematical model with data. The, um, historically, as I will tell you in a few moments, these methods came out of the oil industry. And actually the, the reason for that is that um, Evanson, the historical explanation for how the oil industry discovered these methods, Evanson, who's Norwegian, um, started to work for the Norwegian um, state oil company, Statoil, and there started looking at the use of ensemble methods to solve generic inverse problems. Um, people in the oil industry, but also seismologists, hydrologists, many people are interested in the inverse problem of discovering what's in the subsurface from measurements made at the surface. And subsurface inversion, as it's known, is a, is a big driver for many, many inverse problems and is also related and the cousin of medical imaging problems, which have the same characteristic in medical imaging, one wishes to determine properties of the interior of the human body from measurements made at the surface. Um, I'm going to describe a perspective that comes from this paper in red, and uh, also wanted to draw attention to a really important paper in this area by our chairman and um, Bjorn Sprunk and Starkloff, um, which demonstrated some of the mathematical structure underlying ensemble Kalman inversion and point out to questions that really need to be addressed by the mathematical community in understanding these methods. So um, we're now going to change from dynamical models to a very generic setup in which one has a mapping G, which takes say one Banach space U to another Y and one wants to find an input to, I'll call G the model, an input to the model based on measurements Y, which are found by applying the model to the data, to applying the model to the um, input U and adding noise. So many problems in which one has a mathematical model and data can be formulated in this way. There are variants on it, but I will stick to this particular setting in which the noise is additive for the purposes of this talk. I'd like you to realize how generic this is and one of the beauties of the ensemble method that I'm going to describe is that the algorithms can be implied, applied in settings where G is essentially a black box or a piece of computer code. You give the black box parameters and compute the output which is G applied to those parameters U the algorithms do not require getting inside G, differentiating it, or otherwise intruding upon it. You just need to be able to evaluate it. That has been persuasive in their use, as well as the fact that they're effective, for reasons I will try and explain to you. And the fact that they are black box algorithms for inversion um, is part of the reason for their adoption. Um, I'm working with some climate scientists at Caltech, and there the model G is a, what's called a GCM, a general circulation model. It's a very complicated model for interactions of um, ocean, atmosphere, sea ice, land, and so forth. And one is interested in estimating parameters that enter that model from satellite and other data. Uh, differentiating the model is really not an option. So being able to invert for U given Y and not have to differentiate G is enormously attractive in many application areas. So the um, main approaches to solving this problem are an optimization approach and a probabilistic approach which is related to the optimization approach. Um, the optimization approach um, is encaptured in this objective function which measures for a given u how well when we apply the model g to u it matches the data through this least squares term and then it's perhaps penalized by some prior ticking off information, if, one like, if you like to think of this as a ticking off regularization. And the probabilistic approach uh, rather assigns probabilities to uh, the unknown parameters and the data and seeks to find the probability distribution of u given y and under certain assumptions on the Gaussianity of eta, the Gaussian, the a priori Gaussianity of u and the independence of those random variables, um, this 
probability distribution on the parameters given the data has the form of the exponential of minus the objective function that appears in the optimization problem. So that connection between optimization and probability is pervasive in the field of inverse problems. Ensemble Kalman methods are, have been historically developed with a probabilistic perspective. Um, in my opinion, a lot of their success and the way they've been demonstrated to be successful, however, is really simply from the optimization perspective. Um, and part of that relates to um, issues that I will cover in a few slides time. But I will also show you some recent work in which we extend the algorithm so that it becomes accurate from a probabilistic viewpoint. So I will cover both optimization and probability approaches to the inverse problem. So th there's one really simple, nice idea which connects the inverse problem here in which time does not appear explicitly. It can be the case that G is defined through a time dependent problem, but it may not be, it may or may not be time dependent. Um, but independently of that, one can introduce an artificial time and link the problem here, the inverse problem here, to the dynamical problem that I started the talk by describing in reference to the 3D VAR method. And that link is found, you recall that the, the um, I think one of the persuasive ideas that underlies what Kalman did and is a reason for why it's so successful, is he wrote down a single mathematical model for a dynamical predictive model uh, combined in a meta way with a model for the data. So here I'm going to introduce dynamics on the parameters. They're just parameters, they have no dynamics. So without any data, they, they don't change. So UN plus one is UN. The Kalman setup involves making linear observations. Um, in this inverse problem, G is not in general linear. However, by introducing the variable W, uh, which is WN plus one is simply G of UN, and then considering the data to be simply WN plus one plus noise, this is in exactly the form to which 3D VAR and the ensemble Kalman filter apply. So a number of things, however, to mention, we only have one data point, Y. This algorithm suggests data acquired sequentially at, there's a inclusion sign missing here, data acquired sequentially at a set of steps. These are purely algorithmic steps um, from zero up to M minus one. In practice, this algorithm is applied by taking that data, setting it equal to the given piece of data Y that is made available to us. And to compensate for the fact that we look at the data repeatedly, one can think of uh, increasing the variance on the noise by a factor M, which is the number of steps taken during the algorithm. And that number M will come back in a few moments. So this idea of iterating and applying ensemble Kalman filter um, goes back to Dean Oliver and Al Reynolds in two separate papers, <coughs> both just a little after 2010. Um, but since then, it's really starting to spread out and become a widely used methodology for solving inverse problems for the reasons that I gave. Um, I want to show you a little bit of the structure of the, the resulting algorithm. And I'd like you to look first of all at the second panel on this slide rather than the first one. Um, this gives a set of, uh, through algorithmic updates n to n plus one, a set of estimates of the parameter. J is the ensemble index. Think of J, as I mentioned before, being on the order of hundreds. And this is an update formula to look at the set of ensemble members at time n in the algorithm and map them to the set of ensemble members at time n plus one in the algorithm and to adjust according to how well the data is fit by comparing G applied to the parameters with data Y. And then here is a linear operator which is computed but through some empirical covariances calculated from the data. The details of those don't matter. What I would like you to understand is that um, 
that this operator here involves all of the ensemble members, um, whereas this, the, the remaining terms involve only the ensemble member J. So this is a coupling, which again, we will look at from a mean field perspective in uh, a few slides time. So this is a little bit uh, messy and it's hard to take in all these indices when you first see it. And uh, when I first saw it, I hated it. I, you know, it's a, very difficult as a mathematician to, to find this appealing. Um, however, uh, th there is an appealing way to look at this, which is to compute a continuous time limit. And I think that contains a lot of information about the structure of the algorithm and what it does. So this is an interacting particle system which, recall, is attempting to find, given data y, to find parameters u, so that when one applies g to the parameters, one recovers the data y. We're going to have a set of parameters, j, j of them, indexed by j, and uh, then we iterate in discrete time, the continuous time limit, in which one lets m go to infinity in an appropriate scaling, uh, it gives a time evolution of the ensemble of the particles, which has two characteristics that I want to draw to your attention. One is that uh, this is a system where the, the vector field uh, that drives the evolution of the jth particle is in the linear span of all of the other particles. And the second thing is that the coefficients that are used to compute that linear span um, are have two, two features. The first one is that they drive the jth particle towards the data, that's this term here. And the second one is that they drive all of the particles towards consensus. So they tend to form consensus and agreement. So it's an algorithm which looks for um, both dr dr driving towards the data and consensus across the different particles which are exploring parameter space simultaneously. Okay, so the, the, the algorithm, um, the first thing I would like you to understand about the ensemble method as a way of solving inverse problems is this, that it has these two features of being an interacting particle system which drives each individual particle towards the data and drives the set of particles towards consensus. Okay, so let me show you then some of the consequences of that. Um, I'm going to show you Firstly, a perspective in which one has a gradient flow structure in the parameter space. And then secondly, um, a gradient flow structure in the space of probability measures. So let me just tell you a little bit about the history of the, the gradient flow structure. Um, as I mentioned, Sebastian Reich has been instrumental in looking at continuous time limits in the context of ensemble Kármán filter. And a lot of what I'm going to describe here is based on applying similar ideas to ensemble common inversion. And primarily what I'll describe is work with Claudia Schillings, who's at the University of Mannheim. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Edris Titi made profound connections between the body of work which really arises from Foyash and Prodi in 1967 concerning the, the fact that dissipative partial differential equations are asymptotically finite dimensional. Uh, TT has made connections between that body of work and data assimilation and uh, the, the similar work of that type in the following two papers here. Um, and then this, this is a growing body of work in continuous time analysis as work by Teresa Langer and, and uh, Stanat, both at Potsdam, recently in this area. Um, I will also talk about gradient flow in the space of probability measures. So this is the, I will derive a Fokker-Planck equation through the mean field limit that I've been talking about and generalize the ideas of, that uh, appear in the celebrated paper of Jordan, Kindler and Otto in 1998 for the linear Fokker-Planck equation. And this leads to some interesting um, connections with optimal transport and I'll show you that from the benamou grignier perspective. Um, and the, the work I'm describing here is with uh, Alfredo Gab Gabuno Inigo, who was a postdoc at Caltech, recently moved to Mexico, uh, Franco Hoffman, who is at uh, Bonn, and Wu Chen Li, who is at University of um, 
and, and North Carolina State. And there's been follow-up work by Sebastian Reich in this general area. All right, so first I'm going to talk about gradient structure um, at the level of particles rather than probability. And what I would like to do, let me just remind you of the continuous time perspective, just making sure I have the time visible to me, thank you. Um, we have this continuous time dynamical system. I'm going to describe now in, in talking about the gradient structure, I'm going to talk entirely about the case where G is linear uh, because then statements that I make are exact. Um, the statements that I make are not exact in the nonlinear case, but there is a body of mathematics to try and, and algorithmics to try and deal with that discrepancy. So the purpose of studying the linear problem is to get insight, further insight into this algorithm. And the first observation is that if G is linear, G bar, which is the average of G uh, evaluated across the ensemble is also linear. And one can take the resulting linear operator and compute its adjoint on the other side of this inner product. And in doing that, one gets a term which is the gradient of the objective function that I'm about to show you. And as a consequence, in the case where G is linear, this is an interesting gradient flow with an unusual coupling across all of the members of the ensemble. So I want to show you that here in this slide. So the objective function which drives the gradient dynamics is phi zero and it's of the form um, y minus g of u squared weighted in some weighted Euclidean norm. The particle dynamics in the case of linear g is exactly given by each particle undergoes a gradient flow, but this is preconditioned by a linear operator which depends on all of the other particles. And it is computed through the covariance of all of the other particles. So one computes the mean, and from that mean, one can compute the covariance of the given particles. So What's remarkable about this is that, uh, and I, uh, is the next thing I would like you to take away about the ensemble method, and something that we will get into in more detail in the probabilistic section that I will move on to in a few moments, is that there, the, the rate of convergence of this system is in some sense independent of the linear operator G. And so there's a property of these ensemble algorithms that makes them attractive beyond the things I've already highlighted. I've highlighted the fact that A, they work in practice, that's good, as in they recover on uh, simulation studies to recover accurately the solution of inverse problems. And in real problems such as the oil industry, they produce estimates that are borne out to be useful from an industrial point of view. Um, they are black box in the sense that G does not have to be differentiated or intruded on in any way. But a key point that I'm now making is that they have a property of um, converging in a manner independent of the problem being solved. That's rather vague, but in the linear case, it's precise, and I will make it even more um, convincing when we move to the probabilistic picture. So the rate of convergence for this system is only algebraic in time, but the rate is independent of the, the, um, the problem G being solved. Okay. So um, that work with Claudia Schillings um, initiated an interest in taking this structure, going beyond this algebraic rate of convergence, and also trying to solve, rather than the optimization problem, to try and solve the probabilistic formulation of the inverse problem. And that has led to what I will call here ensemble common sampling. And leads to a very similar structure to the one that I've just described to you, namely a gradient flow for each particle driven by an objective function, which is the same as on the previous slide, but now with a, a tick and off penalty, um, with a preconditioning that's computed from the covariance of all of the interacting particles, and then the addition of noise. So what we have really done here is we've done something that will be familiar from anyone working in statistical physics, 
we've taken a gradient flow and we've put it in a heat bath to try and go from minimizing phi to um, computing a probability distribution e to the minus phi. Okay, so to understand this in a little more detail, I'm going to compute the mean field limit. That means that I'm going to look at the setting in which one has an infinite number of particles. And this is not something that one would do in practice, it's more for conceptual understanding. If you do that, the large interacting particle system becomes an equation for a single particle, u, um, but now the covariance depends on the density of this random variable u, which solves this stochastic differential equation. So this is, a, if you like, a McKean diffusion. Um, Henry McKean introduced theoretical study of stochastic differential equations, which depend on their own law. Uh, here, the dependence on their own law is through the covariance. The covariance is computed through the density of the law governing u. u is random because of the white noise driving the system. So one can compute um, the mean and the covariance and the density of the process through self-consistency must satisfy a nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation, which I've written here. So the key thing to understand about this is even though G is linear, this is a nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation. And um, it's also non-local because it depends on rho and uh, depends on C of rho, which is defined through an integral, both U bar is an integral and C itself is an integral. Uh, with respect to the density across the entire domain. So it's a non-local, non-linear Fokker-Planck equation. <clears throat> but this too has a gradient structure and indeed is a very simple generalization of the work of uh, Jordan, Kindlera and Otto, which is one of these two references, and fits into the more general framework um, developed by Felix Otto later on it incorporated the porous medium equation. So specifically this nonlinear Fokker-Planck equation can be written um, as the time derivative of rho is it's the divergence of the quantity that you see here in brackets. <clears throat> the energy phi is given by um, the energy E is given as a functional on the density rho. It's given by this expression here. And this, in fact, is identical to the structure one has for the linear Fokker-Planck equation, except for the presence of this non-local operator C. And so one can formally take the structure uh, that appears in the, the work of Otto and view this as a gradient flow in the space of probability measures with respect to a metric. And that metric is the original work on the Fokker-Planck equation will be the Wasserstein metric, Wasserstein 2. And here is something called the kalman wasserstein metric, which I will describe on the next slide. But it's really a very simple formal generalization of the uh, existing work. The key point is that in the linear setting, this equation converges to the equilibrium distribution, which is e to the minus phi, at an exponential rate e to the minus t. And what I would like to draw attention to is the fact that that exponential rate is independent of the linear inverse problem being solved. So key point to just reiterate is that the presence of this covariance operator uh, really learns the structure in the problem in such a way that automatically the algorithm overcomes uh, what is known as stiffness in time-stepping algorithms and through the learning of the covariance uh, provides rates of convergence that are independent of the problem being solved. So just to finish um, and show you briefly the, um, the structure, the Kalman structure and how it generalizes the standard Wasserstein metric structure. Um, so the metric tensor that drives the gradient flow uh, for this partial differential equation divergence form is found as a generalization of the standard Wasserstein setting simply by the addition of this non-local operator C in the inner product and in the definition of the sigmas here. And as a result of that, one also has a transport formulation of the 
this common Wasserstein metric, which generalizes the benamou brenier formulation of the Wasserstein distance, again through the presence of non-local operator C in the definition of the cost function and the transport. So um, that brings me to the, the end of the talk. Um, I will just leave this slide here for you to look at. I really wanted to just emphasize that I hope I've shown you that the method is the Kalman methodology is more than a method, it's a way of thinking about how to incorporate data into models. It's been widely used, influential and successful in an enormous number of applications. We're starting to develop a mathematical theory, but there is a great deal of room for applied mathematicians in this field and a need for applied mathematicians. And so I would encourage you to consider this as an area because I believe Incorporating data into models is uh, part of the future of applied mathematics in this century. Thank you very much. Um, I will make the slides available to the DMV and all of the references that I made, uh, you can find them there. Thank you for your attention. I know it's now five to seven and time for you to go and have a drink. Thanks for listening. Okay, thanks Andrew for this uh, fascinating uh, uh, excursion into um, inverse problems, probabilistic and optimization. And let's see, um, I have one question in the Q&A panel. I encourage uh, others to uh, formulate additional questions. Uh, the first one is from Stefan Tren, and he has a, a detailed question concerning the um, ensemble common filter. I don't know if you can go back to the slide quickly where you discuss the ensemble Kalman filter. Mm -hmm. And his question is, how is uh, Xi n j chosen to update the estimate v hat n plus one j? Yes, thanks. So, a very good question. And I'm aware that I glossed over that. There are a number of different things that are done and it depends on the setting, but the basic natural, most natural thing to do for reasons that are somewhat complicated is simply to choose Xi and J independently for every N and J from the same distribution that is a present in the, dynam in the noise which appears in the dynamics model, namely this Gaussian distribution, uh, sorry, this Gaussian distribution. So um, there are good reasons to do that that lead to, that can be backed up by theorems in the case of the case where psi is linear. Uh, and in that setting would lead to a theorem that says that this ensemble common method in the large ensemble limit would recover the common filter, which occurs, which, which is the first slide and describes the setting, the linear setting. All right, so that's basically it. Choose these at random independently for every n and j from the same distribution that the noise has in the assumed model. Um, there are other, for other reasons, you might want to do something different, but that's the basic answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question by Winifred Wollner. Uh, he asks, could you comment on the initialization of the ensemble? Yes, so um, that's a kind of quite applied question. So it depends on the application. Um, so in weather forecasting, there are estimates of the state historically going back a long time and those are continually being used and so the ensemble method will be used on some particular time interval but it will there will be produced from that an ensemble member at the end of the last time interval that will become the beginning of the next time interval and um, typically some Gaussian approximation is made to that and it may be resampled or, or the ensemble will itself be reused. The part of the, what I've shown in this example here, um, and the theory that goes with it that I've not shown you, that starts with the work of TT and um, work that I've done with Dirk Blomke in Augsburg, um, shows that, that there's a stability, which means that at least when initializing from some compact set, um, the initialization will disappear from the prediction after a transient. Thanks. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I see no more. <clears throat> oh, here's another one. Uh, Crystal Penbag. He's asking, is the iterative process related in some form to subgradient methods of Nesterov based on estimation sequences? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, there is a lot of adjacent things I could say about that. Um, Nesterov, Nesterov work on uh, m introducing momentum is one area that's interesting in this area, which relates not to the question you asked, but um, relates to using a different dynamical system uh, perhaps one with second order dynamics rather than the one that I show here. Um, the use of other penalties, which I think relates more closely to your question, such as L1 penalties and um, sparsity inducing penalties is something that um, I have addressed in recent work. And so I think more generally without, I'm happy offline to try and take your question if you email to me. Um, more generally, I think there are, opportunities to generalize, to take other idea, ideas that are current in optimization and been successful in optimization and look at what they would imply in the context of Kalman inversion. For example, replacing this by an L1 penalty is something that is natural and something that um, can be looked at in problems where one might want to find sparse solutions, for example. Thanks. Okay, um, I, I also have a question sort of building on what you just said. So you, you've contrasted the optimization approach and the probability approach to inverse problems. Can you maybe comment on the, the um, opportunities that these, when there's a, a lot of work on the optimization-based approach, this has been going on for 40 years, probability not so much. Could you maybe comment on the opportunities that the probability-based approach has maybe going beyond the capabilities of the optimization based approach. Yes, thank you. Um, I should have in fact emphasized that a little bit more. One of the reasons for wanting to solve the probabilistic problem, which it's important to emphasize, is an order of magnitude harder than the optimization problem because the thing one is trying to determine is a distribution over parameters u rather than a single point u estimate. So one, it is natural to ask wh why one would invest in computing something which is a distribution rather than a single point. Um, and the reason for this is that computing the probability distribution enables one to estimate uncertainties in the things that one learns. Um, many of the models that we are working with today are imperfect. So for example, the climate modeling, which I referred to earlier and which I know a little bit about. Um, most of the predictions of climate over the next 50 years or so are uncertain for a number of reasons, but the primary one is that the ability to predict cloud cover, cloud cover is very uncertain. Um, and if one can estimate the uncertainty inherent in the um, prediction of cloud cover, one could equip predictions about climate change with levels of uncertainty that would enable more informed decision making. So the real opportunity for the probabilistic viewpoint is that it provides the possibility of quantifying uncertainty in predictions and for policymakers to make better decisions on the basis of mathematical models using data. Thanks Oliver. Thank you. Um, so one more question, then uh, we're running a bit late, maybe we'll wrap it up then. So uh, Elias Caravelas uh, asks or says, I still have difficulties understanding how the extrapolation is done with the Kalman filter for predicting future outcomes. Could you comment on that? Yes, was that, uh, I assume that question is with respect to weather forecasting. So, um, in, in the weather forecasting case, the, what is done here is that, so time zero would be the end of a ensemble Kalman cycle. And at, at time zero in this figure here, one would have a set of ensemble members. 
that are the result of data assimilation that is done in negative time in the um, units described here. Then this experiment takes the output of ensemble Kármán filter or 3D VAR at time zero based on data that's been used prior to time zero and the models and makes predictions of the future weather over periods of 24, 48, 72, 96, 120, 144 hours, etc. So those predictions are made by running the predictive model, which is the discretized Navier-Stokes equation, initialized using the output of the ensemble Kármán filter or 3D VAR. In this phase, no data is being used. This is a prediction. And then the prediction is compared with what actually happened to make an estimate of higher skill. And then the two algorithms are compared by their ability to predict and the time horizon on which they're able to predict. 